I want to be the title sponsor, what's it going to cost? I think around 10 million. Yeah, I, I, that's a bit out of my budget. I have the impression that we are in the place where we have to be now. Greg had a really bad back all last week, so we caught up on your podcast with really? me giving him a back massage and him listening to you guys. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful image. <laughs> with exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Ned Bolting. Hello, Richard. Television's Ned Bolting. <laughs> yeah, you're quoting David Miller there, aren't you? Television's David Miller. I did an event with him the other night. I introduced him as Television's David Miller. <laughs> he didn't like it, I don't think. No one likes it. either that or a retired bike rider. I didn't know which he'd prefer. Clothier. Ned's not a retired bike rider, though. No, that's... Ned is very much in his prime as a bike rider. So, listen, we've got tons to talk about today, mainly the World Championships in Richmond, Virginia, which finished on Sunday. Uh, And we're going to talk a little bit about the news overnight, I suppose, that London has withdrawn from its bid to host the Grand Depart of the Tour de France in 2017. Mm. I know Ned's got lots to say about that. But Lionel, first of all, uh, your weekly news roundup, please. Yeah, let's rattle through this. World Championship week, of course, lots of rainbow jerseys up for grabs. Um, Big surprise, really, in the men's time trial. Vasil Kirienka of Belarus won gold ahead of Adriana Mallory and Jerome Coppel of France. That was the one, two, three. Much to many people's surprise because the pre-race favourites, Rowan Dennis and Tony Martin, were only sixth and seventh. In the women's time trial, Linda Willemsen, Danish-born but New Zealand representative, won the women's gold medal. Uh, The road races were, well, I thought they were cracking. We'll talk about them in greater depth uh, later on in the episode. But the headlines are that Lizzie Armitstead won the women's road race and Peter Sagan won the men's road race. As simple as that. Uh, Off the bike, Mark Cavendish's move to MTN Quebec has been confirmed, although we believe the team will be called Dimension Data or Dimension Data Deloitte (laughs) next year. Uh, They're signing up sponsors as quickly as they're signing up riders. They've also recruited Mark Renshaw and Bernie Eisel and are, uh, are, well can't call him erstwhile member of the podcast Daniel Freed because he still is a bona fide member of the podcast. Has he joined MTN Quebec? No he hasn't but he's been tweeting all day about how this is like take that getting back together again. It's a, it's a sort of HTC High Road reunion isn't it at uh, MTN Quebec next year. Meanwhile Team Sky confirmed seven new signings including the outgoing world champion Michal Kwiatkowski and the revelation from the Giro d'Italia Michael uh, Mikel Lander, sorry. And as Richard mentioned, London will not be hosting the 2017 Grand Depart, much to everybody's, well, surprise that they were even in the running at one point and then surprise that they would be given the honour and then decide not to go any further with it. Much to everyone's chagrin, not least friend of the podcast, Prudy, Christian Prudhomme. I don't imagine he'll mm. be very happy. Um, just before we start, and I think we'll probably start with Lizzie Armitstead's win in the women's road race, but you mentioned that... Uh, um, Sort of, t- um, I said, take the high road, a high road reunion there at MTN Quebec. Uh, a good opportunity to plug a forthcoming Friends special podcast, which Daniel's been working on all year, uh, and it's really looking back at high road and exactly what happened. We've got an exclusive interview with Bob Stapleton. Ooh. Yep, uh, breaking his silence. Rolf Aldag, Brian Holm, other people who were involved in that very successful team, HCC Columbia High Road. Um, which disbanded at the end of 2011 and a lot of them coming back together at MTN Quebec so that's coming up very soon as a friend special I'll look back on what actually happened with the end of the high road but um, let's talk about events in Richmond, Virginia men's and women's road races both I thought won by the right rider which is quite unusual Uh, it's quite unusual that the World Championship road race is won by a rider who you can honestly say that is the best rider in the world at the moment and Lizzie Armstead has been uh, really raised her game I think this year Mm -hmm. won the World Cup um, very consistent and it looked as if the race was slipping away from her towards the end when the group got away but came back and was she lucky there or 
was it inevitable that group was going to come back? Did you think, Ned? I know you watched it quite yeah. closely. Well, she's had an... Ex- yeah, I think you have to take that race in the context of her season, which, as you rightly say, has been outstanding. I mean, by far, I know she got the silver medal in 2012, but she's a much, much stronger and more mature and more rounded and complete rider now, albeit in the absence of Mariana Voss, it has to be said, this year. But um, the continuing absence through injury. But Liz- Lizzie Armitstead has grown round by round of the World Cup and, and, and week by week and month by month this year and uh, absolutely deserved that. And I think it was... Um, what she's, I think what she's, what she's begun to learn about herself is that... Um, and this hasn't always featured over the last couple of years is that she can back herself now to win, if not a bunch sprint, although she's quite capable of winning a bunch sprint in the women's scene uh, certainly a group sprint you know against some of the best in the world and uh, in previous years she's fought shy of getting herself into that situation and assumed that the only way she can win a race of the kind of stature of the world is to get away on her own you know always seeking out the tough courses complaining or riding within herself and being uncomfortable when it looks like the, 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 the course is slightly too easy in inverted commas worrying about that not believing in herself but what she's added this year is um, that extra 5-10% of self-belief and it was um, you really saw that in the way it played out because you know in the final uh, I always get the number of meters wrong I can't remember what it was final 300 meters or 200 or something she just maybe 500 I don't know she she decided to go and you kind of thought ooh uh, this isn't going to work because she didn't actually get away and then she had the good sense didn't she to to kind of rein it in sit up recover for however many seconds she was allowed to recover before she had to go again and only a very, very strong and confident rider can pull off a trick like that. Yeah, it was 900 metres to go, actually, when she... she the, the group was probably too big. It was There was the chance of a, a sort of surprise sprint finish, and she very sort of methodically, really, reduced that group. She made everybody chase back and, and spend that effort closing up the wheel, and, and she dragged a group of maybe eight ar- away with her, and the gap opened, and then when everybody got back on... She'd done her recovery yeah. and everybody else was still sort of playing catch up a little bit. But it was the sprint finish, wasn't it, Ned, that really illustrated exactly what you're saying? Because the Belarusian rider went on the right hand side of Armitstead and she just watched her go, didn't react too early. That would have been the obvious mistake or the easy mistake to make. And she was in the perfect position on um, it was Anna van der Bregen's wheel. Um, a great wheel to be on. And she just picked her moment perfectly. And uh, but, yeah, there were numerous opportunities for that race to go wrong for her because I was really surprised. I, I listened to Daniel's uh, description of the course in last week's podcast. I actually thought it was a, it was a belting course. The, the cobbles obviously gave it a, a bit of quirky, um, a bit of a quirky nature, um, but it was just perfectly pitched. We often talk about the World Championship course, and we said it in last week's podcast about how we assume it's going to be a, you know, a, a, a bunch sprint because there isn't there isn't that many meters of climbing but you don't need a long hard climb to make a really good race what made that race with all the corners Mm. that forced everybody to think about positioning think about where to spend effort and if they got anything wrong they were spending more effort over the course of the race and obviously the corners into the climbs um, really made it a very very exciting course to watch a race on and I thought you know that's that to see a world championships that isn't just like one big climb like Ponferrada was last year really varied it and like you say Rich that's what meant we got the two best winners worth mentioning the men's under 23 road race as well which I watched on Friday evening and that was the first indication for me that this was going to produce exciting racing you could see the course was technical that you had to be at the front and that only the strongest guys could be at the front it was very strong out there was carnage you know, if you weren't in the top 30 or so. Um, Kevin Le Dan- Danois uh, won that race for France. French riders first and third, Italian riders second and fourth. Uh, perhaps the most notable incident in that race was Davide Martinelli, son of Gi- Giuseppe Martinelli, the Astana DS, um, who got a break with Ireland's Eddie Dunbar. And um, Eddie Dunbar was very enthusiastic, a little bit too eager, I think, in, in hindsight. But that group that, that formed um, Martinelli was a passenger in it didn't do a tap which that's fine that's up to him 
I didn't really understand why the others were putting so much into it with a, an Italian passenger sitting there. And I say it's fine. It is fine to sit on a, a group, but I don't think it's fine to then attack them as he as he did. There was then a, a wonderful moment of karma when he, his bike collapsed underneath him. His, he had mechanical problems. He was off his bike. Was, that was that was uh, quite an enjoyable moment. But you don't attack after sitting on a group. Well, you, if you, you can, I mean, it's nothing to say you can't, but you ain't going to make friends in the long term. You strike me as the type that might do that, Ned. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely would. I'm that desperate for any kind of success. I totally would. Um, I think I think people can get extravagantly pious about this kind of thing, and I think that um, that's bike racing to a certain extent. What I what I did like was um, I like Dunbar's crazy. I mean, every race he, you know, every time he enters a race that's what he does he just gets up the road and I quite like the way that clearly they are um, whether he's riding for the national team he was a one man team he had no teammates um, in this instance or whether he's riding for his uh, team NFTO they all indulge him he's only 19 I think he's just 19 Um, so you know why give him this why do anything else with this very very young rider at the moment other than just say go and express yourself Um, it's really interesting actually talking to his team as I was at the weekend Um, they are resigned to losing him He's off. Um, he's had, uh, generated a lot of interest from World Tour teams, but as I understand it, it's not a World Tour team that's picked him up. I don't know which one it is, but he's moving up a level. He'll be riding Pro Conti. Do you, do you know? I mean, I don't know where he's heading. Not one Pro Cycling, is it? I, s- I suppose another British team that's moving up to Pro Conti. Yeah, it could be. Uh, that'd be slightly disappointing if it was, I suppose. But um, but he's, you know, he's, he, I know that for a fact that... MTN Quebecer? Three or well. You never know. You never know with their recruitment policy because uh, they've changed. They've changed. MTN, you've changed. Well, that's something we'll be returned to later on. Um, but, yeah, just finally on the women's road race, Lizzie Armistead, an outstanding winner. She certainly um, she rode it, as you say, to win. I, I felt, you know, going back to London in 2012 when she escaped Marianne Voss, she... She resigned herself to second there quite early on in the race, I felt. Um, and and I, I think her mindset, mentality has changed completely. She didn't like a question that she was asked in the press conference about the absence of Mariana Voss, particularly. Um, but she'll go to Rio next year as one of the favourites on what's likely to be a much hillier course and, and perhaps one uh, not quite as suited to her talents. But if she continues to progress as she has and then no reason why she can't win there as well no there is no reason but it's worth you know in this in, in all of our uh, eulogies uh, quite rightly for for what she um p- produced in richmond it's worth uh, i think just as the women's season comes to a close referencing quite how strong the field is and you know with, with a year between now and rio uh, whilst lizzie may well be favorite she's she'll face stern competition you know elisa longo Bugini is the heir apparent anna van der breggen is you know in terms of her physical capability every bit as good as lizzie but she's technically a basket case at the moment i mean she made an absolute dog's dinner of the world cup in the final round she should have won it but and all she had to do was sit on Lizzie's wheel and decided to attack and it played into Lizzie Armitstead's hand and again I thought she was you know, Lionel you referenced it I didn't think she rode particularly smart in Richmond um, but there are a number of riders who um, are coming through to, to you know fill the vacuum that is um, being left by the puzzling absence of Mariana Voss and the big question mark as to whether or not she'll ever come back in any kind of championship Four. Well, Pauline Ferrand Prevot as well, who of course won the world title last year, very young and very versatile, and Fancy probably prob- probably will fancy that uh, course next year. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, brought to you by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. Pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist. Visit trainerroad.com forward slash SPC to try Trainer Road risk free for 30 days. So, you heard a jingle for Trainer Road, our new sponsor, mm. taking us through the winter, Lionel. Uh, we were both out on our bikes this morning, I think, in pre training, preparation, preparatory training for the programs that we're going to be signing up to with Trainer Road over the next few weeks and months. Well, when I uh, got the text message to say that our esteemed guest on the podcast Ned Bolting needed to rearrange and, and meet half an hour earlier that that has basically denied me half an hour's training so I thought it was some kind of cunning ruse by you Richard to be honest to limit my time on the bike yeah so we'll be giving uh, more information about our trainer road well, we'll be receiving more information about our trainer road uh, 
training programs soon, Lionel. I know that we're both extremely excited about that. And what we want to do with that is be able to attack like Peter Sagan in the men's road race mm. on Sunday. Uh, I'm sure a lot, of, well, a lot of people did enjoy, I think, Peter Sagan winning. Well, Peter Sagan winning for a start. He won a race. Um, and he seemed to change his approach. You know, the, gone was the old sort of show, showing his cards, showing his hand too early. He, he left it to the decisive moment. And when he went, he went. And there was a fantastic picture of the moment that he attacked. And you've got Greg Van Avermaet, Edvald Bosenhagen behind, and then the others trailing behind. And the, the expressions on the face tell the, tell the story, really. Sagan looked determined, focused. The others were just gasping and suffering. And that was, that was the moment that he, that he won the race. Although the descent that followed, where he built his gap a little bit, was also critical. It really tested all of Sagan's many many talents um, and yeah again like the women's road race I think a feeling that somebody who deserved to be world champion to wear the rainbow jersey for the year had won the race yeah it's the when Peter Sar- when Peter Sagan won that it's I mean, sometimes with the world it's a bit um, you find out you know maybe you, you haven't been able to watch the race live or, or, or you just find out who's won you go oh blimey he won and it's quite often like that. You think, oh, good on him. That's how did that? I wonder how that happened. You find out that Peter Sagan won at Richmond, and you go, yeah, that makes absolute sense. <laughs> that's that. That's just all. You know, in in hindsight, that was clearly perfectly designed that course for him, and he read it to perfection. He was, as far as I understand, it, I didn't see the whole race. How could anyone see the whole race unless you were paid to commentate on it? It's 140 hours long, um, but. Um, uh, he was pretty invisible, wasn't he? I mean, and up until, as you say, he decided to make his move. And, um, uh, yeah, just great. What can you say? Particularly as he was more or less on his own. Um, yeah, you ride with him. You ride Sagan. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and he might, have, he might have had a little bit of help, I think, from a couple of Tinkoff Saxo people unofficially, um, sort of under, under the table assistance. But it was, um, it was the, it, as you said, Richard, it was that descent that was... Uh, that was just so thrilling to watch. And I think what I think you said that if you want to attract young people to the excitement of bike racing, show them Peter Sagan because although it's perhaps not to be copied, the way he sat down on the top tube, got himself very low, you know, wasn't pedalling down that descent at all, but was clearly opening the gap on the people <laughs> behind him. You know, that looked exciting. The He's about he, the only bike rider in the world who can carry that off, who can actually not look like a complete idiot doing that. <laughs> yeah, and he looks like he's just, he looks like he's just messing about. Um, the way he took the corners was fantastic. On Monday, some uh, footage emerged of him pulling his foot out in the final uphill yeah. rise to the finish and sort of calmly putting his foot back into his pedal and, and carrying on. I mean, there was a moment in the last three 300 metres, perhaps, where it looked like he was dying and the, and the gap was closing. Um, and the sprint behind by that stage was fully committed to try and pip him on the line. But it, he just had a little half glance over the shoulder and then a real a, a sort of nonchalant um, victory celebration, which said, you know... Was anyone really surprised by this victory? Rather than hooray, I'm the I'm the I'm the world champion. Climbed off his bike like a, and then strode like a boxer, like a prize fighter, back down the finish straight. And what was telling, I thought, was that the reaction of some of his peers, rivals, Tom Bonin and people like that, who seemed genuinely happy that he'd won. Even Michael Matthews, who was very disappointed to finish second after perhaps uh, the wrong approach from the Australian team, who had two men up there, Simon Garrens, um, but as Matthew said afterwards, they were both riding for themselves. That perhaps wasn't the best move. But even he said that he was pleased that someone like Peter Sagan won it. I mean, he just seems to have fun. He, he seems to be enjoying himself. And, and this goes right back to when he first emerged, appeared on the circuit in 2010. I was at the Tour Down Under when he, he, he rode that race for liquid gas. And he was ni- I think he was 19 at the time. He was, he was very young. Uh, he got in a break in the opening criterion with Lance Armstrong, who was the oldest man in the race. And uh, he, he, that whole week at the Tour Down Under, he just seemed to have fun. I've told this story many times, but I arranged to interview him one evening, and he'd crash, he crashed that day quite badly, at three kilometres to go or something. So I didn't think he would turn up for the interview, but I went to the hotel lobby as arranged and bumped into his DS, who he'd sent to collect me and take me up to his room, where he was lying covered in bandages and in a right state. And while we were 
talking, I say talking, his English at the time was really not very good and it has improved enormously in that time. But while we were trying to talk, uh, the race was played on TV and when it came to the moment of his crash, he, he, he sort of leapt forward and studied it and wanted to watch the crash and, and to understand what happened and he seemed to quite enjoy watching it. It was quite <laughs> odd but I, I remember thinking at the time, this guy is special and I mean he is special and you've got a particularly uh, close relationship with him, haven't you Ned? Well just by dint of having to, you know the poor guy is it, it's four green jerseys in consecutive years on the tour, isn't it? So every single day he has media obligations and every single day we talk to him. And every single day it strikes me he finishes in second place. You know, he's broken that duck on Grand Tours on the Vuelta now. But um, uh, so, you know, and you do run out of ways. And he's so, you're, he's so right. One of the reasons he's popular, and I don't think he's different between, I think he has a diff, he doesn't put on a different act when he talks to the media as when he talks to his peers in the peloton. And this is what's great about him, I think. Because so this kind of... Um, He's like an open book. His frustration and his puzzlement, and you know, his um, it's impossible for me to win. How can I win? I don't know what to do. I've run out of it. And this wonderful invention of the word unluck. You know, um, he's just built. He's built. You know, innocently, he's built an entire mythology about him, mm. and he's so exceptional. And uh, Lionel, I mean, I was at an event at the weekend with Sean Kelly, who um, is full of admiration for, for Peter Sagan, and I think recognises a kindred spirit to some extent. And it's, it's just so good to see a rider, a throwback rider like Peter Sagan, uh, of a Kelly-esque kind of stature, um, finding a niche in this, in this landscape that does him no favours. Well, he's, he's Kelly-esque in his consistency. Kelly was somebody who'd be competitive from February through to October. And Sagan's consistency is incredible and I think a lot of us feared for what would happen to him joining Tinkoff Saxo on this 4 million euro salary this year having Tinkoff on his back there have been times I think when that has got to him a bit the Tour of California was one but it brought out the best in him he won that race with a phenomenal performance but if you go look back to E3 Harold Becker the race that Geraint Thomas won um, way back in March um, when he was they were away together and Geraint Thomas attacked and dropped Sagan you thought whoa that's you know that shouldn't really happen it should be the other way around and there were rumours about his lifestyle and you know whether the, the 4 million euro salary was doing him any favours his head had fallen off a little bit and that he didn't seem to have it towards the end of these really long races he seemed to be good up to 200 kilometres and not, not good beyond this so to, to go and perform like that in such a long race is a great testament to how hard he's worked I think as well this year well, yeah, and I mean, it's uh, if you include the, the Slovakian time trial and road race championships, I think that makes it 10 wins he's had this year, 15 second places, around about seven or eight third places. He's on the podium in a quarter of the days of racing that he rides. You know, that is incredible. I mean, and I think we said this before, the only stages he couldn't win um, would be the high, high mountain stages. But if he were to get into a, you know, get into a break, he could even win... Win, win those and I mean obviously the big curse in cycling is what can he do next and there's a whole load of classics that he should win a rider of his ability should win and as his maturity and sort of mental focus perhaps changes and maybe the the winning of the world championships will be the making of him as a sort of dominant one day rider but you know the tour of california brought out the best of him in in terms of climbing it really uh, richard you said it pound for pound if if and you called him a prize fighter he is the best bike rider in the world and on the men's side of, of the sport without any doubt it perhaps also uh, did him no favors in a funny roundabout kind of way that a motorbike tried to kill him on the vuelta ending his um, grand tour participation a couple of weeks early because it clearly he came to clearly he came to the world's recovered and fresher than a lot of the other riders or, or who were either undercooked or slightly overcooked but Sagan you know I think that might have worked in his favor ultimately mm. I felt a little bit for Ed Val Boston Hagen, who's clearly in great form. And, you know, he often with him, you, you can see that he knows the moment. He is, his instinct is good. The, the legs just aren't there. We saw it a couple of years ago at uh, the World Championship that Philip Gilbert won. He was similarly well, well positioned, uh, but just didn't quite have it at that crucial moment. And, you know, at one point, uh, seven, eight years ago now, we were talking Boston Hagen as a Sagan like rider. I w I, I first time I've ever been watching bike racing and a David Cameron quote has popped into my head when remember David Cameron said to Tony Blair you were the future once 
I thought of that as Bose and Hagen sort of desperately tried to get Sagan's wheel. Yeah, just on um, Sagan. Sorry, my train of thought has completely gone there. I thought it was a David Cameron mention. The Jeremy Corbyn uh, um, <laughs> anecdote that springs to mind. Who's the Jeremy uh, Corbyn of professional cycling? Oh, goodness me. Um... For those not listening in the UK, he's the leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> For those listening in the UK, he's the leader of the Labour Party. Um, Jeremy Corbyn of professional cycling. This is this is uh, this is not a great podcasting etiquette. Long silences. Um, I was going to say, uh, we don't don't tend to sort of overblow um, sort of Twitter reaction to things. But I thought Oleg Tinkoff's um, reaction to Sagan's win was very strange. So what was it? I missed that. Um, well, he basically said that he was in Russia and he hadn't been able to watch it, which, for you know, for for the for one of the world's well, one of cycling's richest men, it does seem strange that he wasn't able to find at least a, uh, a an online feed to watch watch the race. Um, but it's, one, it's the only race where his team isn't competing, I suppose. And one of the great things about Peter Sang winning the world title is that we'll not have to see his hideous Slovakian champions jersey for another. 12 months and then I guess we will see it again <laughs> quite a lot yeah but we might not see much of the rainbow jersey on the tour as well because it might be all greened up pretty quickly this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast download old episodes absolutely free at thecyclingpodcast.com anyway while we pause there Lionel it suddenly came to you the Jeremy Corbyn of cycling is it's the UCI president Brian Cookson of course <laughs> It's got to be. The physical resemblance is there. They've both got the kind of the beard. They're both, I'd just say, I'm not sure how old Brian is, but he's in his early 60s, I think, isn't he? Jeremy Corbyn, 66. Prefer the open neck look over the tie, I think. Yeah, and they, they're they bringing something different to uh, the world of politics and sports politics, I suppose. Hey, well, let's talking of sports politics, uh, we were going to talk about the Tour de France, the Grand Depart in London that none of us knew was going to be happening and it turns out it isn't before we talk about that let's hear exclusively uh, a couple of little clips from Ken Livingston the former mayor of London who was the predecessor is the predecessor to Boris Johnson the current mayor who has made the decision that the Grand Depart will not come to London in 2017 Ned you met Ken Livingston for your book on the road bike which was about sort of British culture cycling culture I guess and Ken Livingston was one of the people you met and you spoke to him about uh, the Grand Depart in 2007 which was hugely successful and about the prospects of another one coming can you just introduce this, these little clips that we're about to hear yeah the first one uh, just gives you a sense of how cheap <laughs> the Grand Depart in 2007 was and how much of a no brainer it, it was really for London you know to, to, to get hold of and capitalise on and the second clip um, and you really have to take this in the context of an election campaign that Ken was fighting and losing against Boris Johnson in 2011 is his take on um, the Johnson regime and their attitude towards bringing the race back to London. Did you know anything about the option to bring a stage of the Tour de France back to London? Yeah, well, we, we, we'd virtually that was a done deal because they were so over the moon and in my talks with them, which is very informal, but that's the way you, d you deal with them, you know, no lawyers always around. I said we'd like to have a stage before the Olympics. And as far as I so said, within the lifetime of this administration, yeah, yeah. there's supposed to be a stage before the Olympics, but I mean, apparently this, that hasn't been pursued, so it's not happening. Um, but certainly, one of the first things I'll do is you know, be off to see them and say, you know, when can we do another Grand Depart or at least get a stage? So coming to London was you know, amazing for you know, world cycling and the tour, so they'll, they'll jump at it, you know, and, and I mean. I think it's always, I mean, the earliest you'd get one is in the final year of a term if you started bidding for it. Uh, have you got, if it just makes such financial good <coughs> sense, hmm. and it's a relatively easy gig hmm. to organise, have you got any idea why that might have gone away under this current administration? Because, I mean, Boris doesn't initiate anything or do anything. Boris is basically lazy. The tour officials went out to a restaurant, we drank too much, we had a good laugh, you know. It was such an easy, you know, pleasure to work with them. 
you took them to, I think I'm right saying, did to the Pont de la Tour, didn't you? Yeah. Do you remember yeah. that dinner? I don't remember. Yeah. It blurs. Yeah, I, I feel mean, it does. I'm sure I, I, I think they carried me out at the end of it. I mean, but they, they enjoy themselves, and they were a real pleasure to work with. They really were. Did, did the name, um, I think Bernardino, it's a name that probably means nothing to you even now, but uh, he's a five times winner of the Tour de France. Oh, right, right. He's one of their ambassadors. He right. probably, that didn't, probably... In those days, probably there was the, the old guy who was just giving up and handing over to Proudhon. Um, who was that? Leblanc. Jean yeah. Leblanc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was giving up. He was great. Was he? Um, was he the man who you had to deal with when it came to? Yeah. Well, we met. What cost? The two of them were all that. Well, there was no problem. It cut doesn't cost anything. But well, it cost and seven million quid. Didn't it? Yeah, but we only had to put in. I mean, we had to we had to pay them one and a half million the honour of doing the Grand Depart. Then there was putting on the event. Uh, we, we do stuff like that all the time, you know. Um, and we... I can't remember... What, I, it's in the autobiography that I think the figures we, we made 90 million or something 110 like or yeah, something yeah. like that. It was a I tenfold. Mean, compared the rate of return on putting on the Tour de France compared with putting on the Olympics. <laughs> yeah, it's just so cheap. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for the Cycling Podcast. So there we heard Ken Livingston, the previous London mayor. And um, we've learned today that Boris Johnson, the current mayor, did kibosh it. It was about the contracts were about to be exchanged. It was going to be announced very soon uh, that the 27 Grand Depart was going to come to 2017 Grand Depart was going to come to London 10 years after its last visit it's not going to happen now and I don't imagine Tour de France bosses are too pleased about that Ned I think you've been appearing all over the media today talking about this what's what's your take on it um, I think that it is uh, the right decision reached in a, a terribly incompetent way because, you know, why do you bid for something? So if you bid for something assuming that there's a certain kind of asking price that you're going to be, you're going to have to find. And if the Grand Depart in Yorkshire was 27 million, then with three years inflation added to that, the figure of 35 million doesn't strike me as too surprising. Um, that said, it's, it's worth uh, stressing that not all that 35 million, far from it, goes to ASO. If you listen to that clip from Ken Livingston, he explained that they paid in 2007 1.5 million directly to ASO and the rest of the 7 million, so the other 5.5 million, was made up of logistical, you know, getting the thing on sort of thing. So whilst I would imagine ASO have considerably upped their expectations of what is paid directly to them, not all of that 35 million is going into their coffers. Um, so, you know, why bid for something uh, only to withdraw when you find out that precisely the kind of money you were expecting to pay, then, you know, it just strikes me as, you know, they've, they've either changed, they've either not appreciated how much, how much they might have to pay or they've changed policy midstream. And I think it's the latter. I think they've got cold feet midstream. And I don't think they're wrong. Um, I think that it was ill conceived to bid for it in the first place because um, now that's not to say I don't think we are ready even as early as, as 2017 for another UK Grand Depart, I just don't think it should be London. Um, I think that uh, London now hosts year on year the final stage of the Tour of Britain. Fantastic circuit this year, right in the middle of you know, Regent Street and everything. And Ride London, Surrey Classic has also shuts down central London for a big bike race twice a year. Um, 2014, London hosted a stage of the Tour de France. 2007 isn't that long ago. And frankly... Uh, Londoners' eyes have been opened to cycling and competitive cycling in all its forms. I don't think you'll re you'd really shift the landscape further that much more than has already been done. And frankly, as a London commuting cyclist, I'd prefer to see them build, spend that money on um, segregated cycling lanes, etc., etc., and leave the playing field open to Edinburgh, for example. Yeah, I mean, I think 2007, why did the tour come to London? It came because it was part of a, t a Transport for London strategy to persuade more people to use bikes. Um, it was around about the time of the launch of the what had become now known as the Boris bike, even though it was Ken Livingstone who put them uh, into place, um, to promote cycling as part of the, of the infrastructure. And as we know, we don't, we don't want to get sort of too political on the cycling podcast, but um, people are still getting killed on the roads just commuting to work on their bikes. And that that is the problem that needs to be solved. Yes, it would be fantastic to have another Grand Depart in the UK, but I think, Ned, you're absolutely right. It should go to an, another region. And I also think that, you know, ASO 
in their uh, in their eagerness to increase the uh, financial worth of their events, um, by London really helped them do that. Yeah. It really expanded their horizons a, a great deal, and we've all been to the Grand Depart subsequent to that. You know, some of them have been really low key. I mean, the Vendée was very low key. The following year, two thousand and eight, uh, was that Brittany, Brittany and the Brittany two thousand eight. The Vendée a few years later was was also low key. Even Monaco, you know, a, a, an iconic venue in two thousand and nine, but a real sort of flat feeling that the Tour de France Corsica in twenty thirteen virtually deserted. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, and and so you know the the foreign grand depart has become a, a key part of ASO's kind of business strategy. Um, the price has gone up accordingly, and I think you know the, the ASO may well have to rein in their expectations a little bit. Well, London is a prestige place to have it, and you wonder if that's a big part of the attraction for ASO. But it is very unusual to hold the grand depart in the same place. So, you know, 10 years apart when there are all these other places to go to. Liège 2004, 2012, yeah. And of course, Utrecht this year, the, it, you know, the, the, it used to be one year on, one year off, but it, it seems to be more fluid and flexible now. And there's talk of a, a Germany uh, Grand Depart, which I think it would be fantastic. You know, that would be potential that could do for, for Germany what the Grand Depart did for British cycling back in 2007 because I think it did kickstart a lot I think you know it, it helped uh, it, it kind of it kind of galvanised Dave Brailsford and his ideas to set up a pro team so the genesis of Team Sky is almost in that Grand Depart in 2007 it showed that huge appetite for it while also uh, you know allowing uh, the likes of Geraint Thomas and Mark Camdish to make their debut and, show, and, and prove that the, the riders were coming along as well it's interesting, when this was first mooted about London getting heavily involved in July, uh, during the Tour de France, I, I had a kind of um, off-the-record conversation, I'm quite happy to put on the record now, with Dave Brailsford, as you do. We were just talking about it, and I, and I voiced precisely my own concerns that I've just voiced about, you know, killing the goose that lays the golden egg, over-exposing the Tour de France to the British public, spoiling us, really, and, and it takes away this, this sort of special feeling that it only visits maybe once in a generation. Um, and he went, hmm, interesting be good for us though and I think that he in his you know he has to keep Sky as sponsors happy and constantly setting them new targets and things that they can focus on and I think a, a British Grand Depart especially in London would have been really important for Sky in terms of you know the valuation they put on the team and that sponsorship but you know everybody involved in cycling sees it in slightly different ways and we as journalists probably feel well I quite fancy going to Germany actually you know rather than necessarily London in 2017 because it's interesting and it's new territory or you know revisiting visiting old territory and uh, but so I can entirely understand British cycling fans who may be listening to this podcast who are very disappointed as well you know we each take our own little bit out of the tour but I mean I, I think it, I think it was as I say I think it's a correct decision reached in a very very kind of cobbled together kind of fashion but there will be a Grand Depart in the UK at some point in the next four to five years um, several other places are in uh, in the running for it I think Edinburgh's bid is revived there's a couple of others that I've heard rumbles about uh, dotted around the country um, so it will come back and I think it will be beneficial if it's not not in London what about what about the worlds what? well there's Tom Yorkshire um, our friend Sir Gary Verity has been speaking about that it's very, very, very expensive. Apparently, it costs more to host the Worlds than it does to have a Grand Depart. They, they shut the road down for a week. Uh, yeah, it's longer. The the UCI make a lot of UCI charge a lot of money. The UCI make a lot of demands for prime hotel rooms, an awful lot more than ASO. I'm led to believe. So, the the financial outlay is much greater, and I think there's a concern that the the profile among not among cycling fans but among the general population isn't the same as as for so i don't know financially it's a harder sell i mean really honestly for uh, anything other than the, uh, the hardcore cycling fans um three quarters of the program of events is not attractive even in richmond the crowds were pretty small for everything except the men's road race on the sunday and to a degree the women's road race on the saturday listen let's talk just i think you have to dash off soon ned we're going to talk about that again to to itv news this time don't give them your best stuff you know hopefully you've, you've, <laughs> you've, you've used that on us um we must mention it and we'll talk just briefly i think on on some of the other signings cavendish tmt and quebec and yep. team sky have un- unveiled 
build an incredibly strong lineup. Just a quick mention for an event that we're doing on Sunday the 15th of November at Lord's Cricket Ground, the home of cycling, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. It's the home of cricket. Yeah, that was a deliberate mistake in that. Oh, see, so was that okay. yes. heavy use it's, we're, we're taking over the home of cycling. It's, uh, um, uh, we're going to take it over for the day. We're doing a cycling podcast live event, 2 to 3 p.m., Sunday the 15th of November. It will be recorded and released as a podcast as well. So come along. We need an audience. Come along. It's uh, Tickets are available on the London Sports Writing Festival website. Yeah, we're, we're going to come up with some kind of idea, aren't we? For uh, sim- <laughs> Similar to uh, the Imperfect Tour de France. It'll be structured, Lionel. It will be structured. There will be uh, a, an idea at its core. It won't just be us rambling on like normal. Um, no, no. They'll be, it'll be carefully planned and yeah. thought out. Yeah. Don't, don't you worry. Okay. Uh, you're just going to plug the, the, the Imperfect Tour de France event that we did at Foils uh, before the tour um, to give you a flavour of what we can do live in front of an audience. <laughs> this is uh, desperate. <laughs> yeah, uh, sign up to become a friend of the podcast. It's only £5. There's a whole host of specials. We've got three or four more to come before the end of the year. Uh, thecyclingpodcast.com for details. One of those will be me in conversation with David Miller, which is happening this Thursday in Manchester. I think tickets are still available for that. We're going to be releasing that as a special podcast as well, talking about his new book, the racer which is very good I recommend it thoroughly um, let's just talk quickly on transfers Mark Cavendish MT in Quebec first mentioned I think on the cycling podcast back in May uh, Daniel to give him Daniel Freib to give him his credit mentioned it mooted it on the cycling podcast back in May after the tour of Turkey when he spoke to Brian Smith and Brian Smith had his first conversation with Cavendish at the tour of Turkey about possibly joining the team it's come to pass Dimension Data and Deloitte are the new sponsors on board. Is it going to work? The this sort of reunion, the boy band back together, Eisel, Renshaw, Cavendish. We think maybe Brian Holm as well. Is it going to work, Ned, or is it going to end in tears? Well, comebacks, generally speaking, or rather, you know, what is this a comeback tour? I don't, don't call it a comeback. Regrouping, general regroupments of riders, you know, after several years, after great success. That, you you know, mentioned there of Sean Kelly, the commentator on the Home of Cycling, British Euro yeah, Sport. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, uh, don't tend to work, do they? It doesn't tend to work in sport. Revisiting past glories with your, uh, with your compadres who brought you that success. However, um, he does need... <laughs> I mean, what is self-evident is he does he does need a, a team absolutely built around him, and I'm not sure that's. Although he had a tremendously strong, in theory, kind of lead out at Eddie's quick step, it hasn't always worked out that way, and um, hasn't been. For whatever reason, it's quite hard to put your finger on why it didn't really work at Etix quick step, mm-hmm. given the big engines that he had at his disposal there. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of I hope I hope it does, but who knows? Who knows? Yeah. What it does, what, 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 it does make me slightly curious or slightly uneasy is that was a team that kind of grabbed people's attention for very different reasons, actually, um, and it seems. In a way, a shame that they uh, will have will have to abandon some of the principles that they brought to the fore in order to accommodate Mark Cavendish and his Grand Tour or his Tour de France uh, ambitions. Well, I suppose there are two ways of looking at that, aren't there? I mean, Mark Cavendish is a global star who will bring more attention to the team and, and probably will become a significant figure in, in Africa, perhaps. I, I don't know. The other thing is, is that the other sort of concern, I guess, though, is some of the other riders on, on the team. Someone like Steve Cummings, who we've spoken about, who is very much a free spirit. There'll be a lot of riders on that team. I imagine Edval Bosenhagen, Tyler Farrar, who, Ned, I have to take issue with because we did an event in Liverpool last week and you you were laughing at the idea of Tyler Farrar preparing for the World Championships. I know, and he showed himself, didn't he? He, sh- he and his ponytail were fully on display. Said, what's Tyler Farrar preparing <laughs> for the World Championships for? What's he going to do? There where he was. You, there he was on the attack. He got himself on TV. Where anyway, Tyler Farrar and, and Cavendish have a very prickly relationship. The idea of Farrar being part of his lead-out train is, seems pretty far-fetched to me. And some of the other riders on that team who, who bought into the whole... Goss. Cholek, Goss, Farrell. will Goss still be there? Theo Boss, poor old Bosenhagen. Oh, you know he's going to get elbowed to the fringes again, isn't he? Just as he's kind of, you know, like a little his mojo again. yeah, just sort of like a little mole. He's popped up <laughs> out of his hole and he's won the Tour of Britain in very sort of uh, you know impressive style. And then sort of Mark Cavendish swaggers, swaggers back in like a like a sort of badger baring his teeth, black and white stripes badger. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think it's a, it's a strange one, but I think we talked about this a while back about how a team, as it grows, it has to 
it has to move to the next level. Otherwise, you know, it's attracting these sponsors. It has to deliver value for those sponsors. It, it, you know, developing riders from Africa, if that remains part of their core reason for being, then I think that would be fantastic. Um, the question is whether there's room for all of that as well as trying to keep Mark Cavendish in the wins that he's accustomed to, to, to aiming for. Well, he's super happy. Mark Cavendish uh, I think I, I saw the press release today and I, actually I think he's only happy which is maybe cause for alarm he's not he's not super happy he's only happy should we be worried should they be worried very but maybe 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 they're just doing um, maybe they're just doing the right thing now and, and assembling that kind of ridiculous roster of slightly superannuated sprinters who aren't going to win you that many races was the wrong thing to do and actually maybe you're right and they, they have got their marquee sprinter now who will win races and that's probably what they should have done all along but you'd have thought there'll be a lot of Farrells and Gosses and Burson Hagens and uh, who's the other one Chiolek and Boss of the world unless they can have a nine man kind of lead out full of Milan San Remo winners there, there are a few guys there I could see there are a few guys there I could see fitting into there's a lot of Milan San Remo winners in that team is that a record is that a record Good. But a guy like Teo Boss, I could see him fitting into a lead-out train. But I'm not sure about Goss. I don't know but if EBH. EBH, yeah, and Van Bosenhagen. Uh, Farrell now. Well, Tyler. The, the question is Tyler Farrar because, as I say, um, he he. My, my, I did an interview with Mark Cavendish one January in a in a training camp. I can't remember where it was. Uh, I think it was Mallorca and I was we were doing a thing for a magazine where it was previewing the season ahead and you know profiling all the top sprinters and getting him to discuss each of his rivals and what their strengths and weaknesses were and I was going through the list came to Tyler Farrar and Cavendish was not happy he didn't regard him as one of his right no you know you know bleep <laughs> including him in a list of my rivals he's not a rival you know and he was just was there, Russell Downing on the list? There was, neither, there was Needle there. Russell Downing wasn't on the list, so they probably should have been. But um, no, it was quite interesting. So I don't know if those two have buried the hatchet or how they will be accommodated together in that team. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. And I mean, I think even Brian Smith and Mark Cavendish, I mean, that's that's going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting dynamic, isn't it? Two quite... Um, I would have thought quite different characters. Uh, They've always got on, though, I think, yeah, Cavendish and yeah. Brian. Yeah, but Brian, I mean, Brian's a funny one. I mean, I saw a couple of his tweets this week about uh, Cav leading out Tekla Heimnot for King of the Mountain points. Obviously, tongue-in-cheek, obviously a joke, but you know, that's the sort of prickly little comment that I'm not sure, you know, somebody who's a team manager should really be putting in the public domain. I don't well, maybe know. that will happen, Lionel, <laughs> ye of little faith. You know, Mark Cam just could turn himself into completely different kind of rider who knows listen we better wrap up I think you've got to dash off Ned you're, yeah. you're much in demand by the media today so we're very so one thing um, have a little look at the uh, six day event coming up in London you're talking about upcoming forthcoming races I think this is going to be on Eurosport as well by the way um, so there you go hashtag home with cycling um, that's going to be turned into a jingle <laughs> <laughs> no it's not um, yeah it is what the hell um, anyway have a look at the six day event coming up in London that Mark Cavendish was supposed to be riding but isn't but I am working on the event and I've just come from the velodrome actually and I've had a sneaky little preview look at the riders who are going to be riding and um, in terms of six dayness and trackiness and all that kind of thing um, it's proper good and uh, very international and um, yeah, a six day for the first time in 30 or 35 years. I think the last one was at Wembley Arena, a skull six day. Uh, it's back and um, I think we should all get behind it because it could become a thing. We're going to do a little featurette on the six day looking ahead to that. We're going to speak to Gary Beckett who's got lots of experience of working on six day races as a swanier and Rob Hales and the people that I think yeah and uh, if you want to listen back to a bit of six day action last year I went to the Ghent Six um, you can listen how could we forget episode. how could you forget do you remember the Ghent Six cat that yeah. ran out onto the track and nearly caused a crash there was an international incident about that for, for 15 or 20 minutes um, but yeah listen back it was in November 2014 if you go to our website thecyclingpodcast.com and go to latest episodes you'll have to scroll through a bit but you'll find it or it's on on your itunes uh, device or whatever just scroll back and find it great well listen thank you very much ned for joining us hopefully you'll join us again soon um and thank yeah thank you ned pleasure thank you thank you lionel thank you richard thank you ned 
You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.